of the writing, what I remember most is the day that I stumbled upon the end, uh, which was about two or three days before I thought I was there. You know, um, so I, I have this tendency to 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 have an idea of an ending, you know, and as I'm approaching it, I realize that the real ending is about, you know, uh, uh, ten yards before the actual ending. You know, uh, in part because I don't want to over-explain things. Um, so I remember how unsettling it was to write um, the last sentence, uh, and with this accomplished, they all felt better, and just sort of the the, the kind of electric shock that I felt when I realized that that was the, the end of the book. Um, I closed the computer and walked around the block and came back and looked at it again and I was like, oh, wow. Um, this really strange feeling that, because I've been working on currently on a novel now for five years, I haven't had that feeling again because I haven't stumbled upon a new ending of, for this particular book. Um, so, so in terms of the writing of the book, I would say that was the moment that I, that I, that I remember the most and felt so, um, uh, but elated, confused, and uh, uh, shocked by. Um, in terms of the publication of the book, you know that that's like a whole whole different thing. Once you put a book out in the world, and if you're uh, fortunate enough to 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 be able to talk to and um, communicate with people who are interpreting the book from their own cultural reality, um, it, it that that just becomes a whole different a whole different thing, and and it's a real privilege. I have to say, it's been one of the most exciting things that, that's, that's happened to me. Um, so I've gone to Germany and talked about the book there, and, and there the book is about you know, the legacy of the Nazis. You know? And then I go to Spain, and there it's about the Franco years. And I go to Chile, and it's about Pinochet. And when I go to Argentina, it's about the Dirty War. You know? And in each different country, there's, there's, a, there's a new interpretation um, because people are bringing their own history to the, to the text. And, uh, and it's something I find fascinating, and it's, it's been a really interesting um, process to hear uh, you know, what people bring t to the text that I wrote you know, on my own in my own little world. Um, and I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about the book. I've learned to talk about the book in ways that I didn't, uh, I didn't really, with language I didn't have when I was writing it. You know? um, in some ways, I know the book better now than I did when I was working on it. Um, because I have this distance and I'm able to see certain themes and how they play out, whereas when you're actually doing the work, you, it's only character, sentence, scene. Um, it's a totally different thing. Gr growing up in, in the United States, um, we... Um, very far from our, from our family in Lima. We spent a lot of time um, sort of trying to figure out ways to communicate with our family back home. This is something that, you know, for younger audiences will seem totally strange, but there was no internet and there was no Skype and there was no uh, phone cards and cheap international calls. I mean, this was a different era. Um, mail was very sort of uh, slow and uh, unreliable. Um, and so what we would do is make these little radio programs um, so Sundays we would gather in my parents' bedroom and my father would record with a cassette tape greetings to the family um, and do little interviews where he would interview us about school and, you know, my sister might recite a poem, I might, you know, you know describe a day at, you know, in first grade or whatever. And these tapes, you know, would be passed along to a family member who was traveling or someone, uh, you know, or we would risk it and put it in the mail or whatever. And we would get back similar tapes from Lima. And um, so for, for me, I think this was, this was uh, these were really important memories. They sort of really encapsulate um, the, the power of the human voice and, and how uh, this desire and this need to, to communicate with this family that I, that I barely knew. You know, I just knew that they were important, but I didn't know why I didn't know them. I could barely picture them, you know? Um, it comes for my father. It came out of his. He he got his start in radio. Um, my father was a was a, a soccer announcer at age fifteen in Arequipa, calling soccer matches. Um, and a lot of my family still works in radio. My my uncle Lucho is still a radio DJ in in Peru. And um, and in two thousand one, I went to visit uh, a cousin of mine, Cecilia, who was working in the north. And um, this also was was a, a really 
seminal moment because it brought home to me the importance of, of radio, not just uh, you know, for me where radio is entertainment and a way to communicate uh, with family, but in isolated areas, uh, rural areas, uh, kind of the places that are forgotten by the state, we would be in the middle of nowhere and come across uh, a shepherd with a radio around his neck. You know? um, and there, my, my cousin was working in campesino radio stations in, in rural Cajamarca. And, uh, and their radio rep replaced the newspaper, the telephone, you know, the internet, of course, and, uh, and just was, was a, the most important means of communication. Um, so if a baby was born, you know, someone would walk two days to the campesino radio station and announce the birth there, and then everyone would come meet the baby, you know? Um, if there was a flood and so and so, you know, that was the only, uh, the only way people would, would, would know. You know, and this is a, an area where there were, you know, newspapers don't get there, you know, magazines don't arrive, uh, a place where to think of the state as an entity that has any sort of a, a power or, or impact on your life requires real imagination, um, requires a really sort of uh, almost fabulous notion of, of, uh, of reality. Um, this, you know, there's no roads, there's no nothing. And so, um, everything is self-generated, including the radio station, but the radio station is sort of that, that connection to a broader conversation that, that, that people know is happening without them, and they would like to participate, but they can't. Um, and uh, I traveled in this area in 2001, um, sort of mid-2001, 2002, I'm sorry, and um, it's no accident that you know. Shortly thereafter, I started working on the Lost City Radio. I mean, it was just such a, a, a such a powerful experience to see these these uh, the real sort of uh, impact that radio was having on on people's you know people's lives in very isolated places. It, it becomes a lifeline for people. It becomes a, um, a, a you know, it's like someone's listening. You know. The idea that someone's listening to these people who, you know, there's no one in society would confuse them for powerful people. You know, they're poor, they live in isolated regions that 4,000 meters above sea level, it's cold, you know, transportation is difficult, they have to, you know, hop on a milk truck six hours to get to the provincial capital, which is still the middle of nowhere, you know, and, uh, and yet, you know, they can go to the radio station and, and pass a message on. And uh, it's incredibly powerful. You know, so there's, there's another thing that you asked me earlier about moments. And this is, this is a, I, I, I just remembered this. Uh, it it's a, it's really is one of the most important things that ever, I think, that ever happened to me. Uh, in 2001, I was living in San Juan de Lurigancho, which is the neighborhood on which I based Tamoe in the novel. And I'd studied anthropology in college. And, uh, there was a family at the corner that was sort of taking care of me. They weren't taking care of me, they were just, I became friends with them and they were sort of looking out for me because uh, I clearly wasn't from the neighborhood. This is a, um, one of the thousands of sort of improvised residential areas that are built up, uh, land takeovers and sort of created in this ad hoc manner and then eventually become part of the city. Um, but at the time, it was a very poor area, um, very, very far from everything, even though it isn't that far at all. It's just there was no transportation. And um, so I remember one night I was talking to, to, the, to the father of this family, a man named Lucho Arones, and, uh, and he asked me what I'd studied in, in college, and I told him I'd studied anthropology. And he said, oh, then you can help us. And I was like, well, sure, you know. And he went to the back uh, of the house and came back with this folder, and he pulled out this folder, and, uh, and on the folder was a list of names. And it turned out that he was from a town in Ayacucho. And his family and most of his town had left because there had been a, a, a mass killing there. And the names were uh, first, first last name, second last name, uh, first name, middle name, you know, and then age. And it was all the people who'd been killed in, uh, and it was, it was uh, in, in this, in this, um, uh, this incident, um, and so I'm holding this list, and basically what he was asking me to do was, you know, he thought I was an anthropologist, a forensic anthropologist, I suppose is what he thought I was, and he wanted me to help him dig up a mass grave. This is essentially what he was asking me. I was 20, 
23, 24 years old uh, with a useless BA from an in anthropology. I mean, basically, you know, I read Frantz Fanon and, you know, he gave me a degree. And of course, I had nothing at all I could offer this man. And here's a list of people, and it was fathers and sons, you know, it was like, you know, whatever name, you know, age 40, and then the same last names, you know, age 18, you know, and it was just horrifying and totally helpless. And the, the, the list that appears on page one of the novel has as an uh, antecedent this, this list that I held in my hands and felt that I couldn't do anything with and felt, of course, just absolutely helpless um, and fraudulent having to explain to this man that uh, although I was a foreigner and although I was American and educated and, you know, and although here I was offering to help, I couldn't do anything. I think the, the, the idea that someone is listening uh, is, uh, is powerful and it's a consolation, you know? Uh, in, in for many people, in, in, uh, in particular, I think the power, um, perhaps the popularity of Norma's radio show in the novel comes from, from that very idea. She, she's in the novel described as having this magical voice. And, um, and specifically what that voice does is um, is, uh, is transmit a kind of human warmth um, that people aren't getting elsewhere. And she's allowing people to talk about this most basic, basic uh, space in their life, you know, the, the space that isn't filled by these people who've disappeared. Um, people have disappeared for any, any number of reasons, uh, but what Norma does is create a, a place where it's okay to talk about them, it's okay to say their names. I mean, just saying the, the name of someone who's gone missing um, and sort of establishing that, no, I'm not okay with the fact that they're not here, you know, uh, um, is, is important. And, and uh, the corollary to that being that occasionally what Norma does is, is orchestrate these reunions where people hear their names on the radio and then say, oh, that's me, you know. And, uh, and the fact that she has that, that power that's almost magical um, is, uh, is, is where she gets, you know, this aura about her.